Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Um, so tonight you are on the party and uh, you are going to, to read out of your autobiography. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, uh, what happened is that when I was 18 years old and uh, living in California, I was uh, from, uh, from a family in Beverly Hills, uh, upper middle class family, I um, I left I left America. I traveled halfway across the world, and immediately I became the the first foreigner to ever be a member of the order of naked yogis, naked yogis and shamans called Naga Babas. And to this day, 37 years later, I'm still with them. And in fact, I've become uh, the, the head of a family of Naga Babas. So, uh, at the time you were touring through the world and um, spreading this, this message, this spiritual message, um, what did you feel about that? Did you feel that you were being treated well? Yes, yes. I've, uh, at this particular time, I've come to Frankfurt to be at the, the book fair and to meet with, with so many people and see if I can uh, have my book translated into German. Oh, okay. I've ha I have many friends here in Germany and I think there's many good things happening in Germany and, uh, mm -hmm. and I feel that, uh, that um, this would be a really good place for, uh, for my book to be available to people. Well, I'll do some. I'll, I'll talk at the party uh, for a little while. Uh, I'll talk about my life a little bit, and I'll talk about what it is to be a Baba, uh, a shaman in the uh, in the modern sense. And then I think what's what's interesting is is that the the style of party that uh, Sven is making this uh, this Goa trance. It's it's more than than just having a good time. Although the the main thing is to have a good time and to dance and have fun, but the Goa trance style of music is also where we all connect with each other, raise consciousness, and at the same time connect with the invisible spirits of the earth. So that's the connection between the Baba and the music and the dance, is that what, what a Baba does actually in India is the Baba is connected with nature and connected with the earth spirits so that he is able to give blessings to people that come to him. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll speak for a little while and then I'll take uh, questions. And then I'm bringing some magical items with me uh, to give people. So anybody that wants uh, magical items from, from India, I've brought so many things that will allow people to connect with the earth beneath their feet and the, uh, the earth spirits that uh, inhabit Frankfurt. And in fact, I've, uh, I've discovered that actually Frankfurt is a, a very ancient place of what we call the Mother Goddess. And uh, one of the ways that we can tell this, it's quite funny actually, but one of the ways that we can tell this is that the sign of the Mother Goddess is prosperity. So that in, in some ways we can tell prosperity from uh, trees full of fruit and fields full of uh, grain, but Frankfurt is full of banks, and banks are also a sign of great prosperity. So uh, whether or not we can access that prosperity is another issue, but at least we can see that there's an ancient presence of prosperity here in Frankfurt. So I'm very excited to be here. And I intend to celebrate Frankfurt tonight. So have a lot of fun tonight. Thank you. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I have a lot of people that come. 
That would be nice. Thank you very much. And be well and be happy. Goodbye. Barbara Pudi, welcome in Frankfurt. It's very Thank nice you. that you are here. Thanks a lot. You're here um, for the book fair also to uh, make contacts with uh, publishers about your book because now it's only in, uh, written in English so you want to translate it in other languages also and what is your intention of your book or why, how did you come to write this book? Well, first of all, I wish I, I could understand everything you said before. I heard Goa Gill mentioned a few times and uh, and I should tell you that really the, the, uh, the reason that I'm here is because Sven and Tina brought me here and I really uh, thank both of them a lot. I think this is great what they, uh, what they set up and this whole trip they arranged for me. And uh, I thank all of you for coming. So... Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about my life, which is also reflected in my book, but I think, I think it's more interesting if, if I just sort of talk freely about, um, about what, what brought me to India and um, how I became a Baba. And I think more interestingly, what we'll get into is what the connection is between um, being a Baba and uh, being in Frankfurt, and uh, the connection between uh, being a Baba and traditional spirituality and Goa trance. So um, there I was in 1967, 1968. The, the world obviously was very different than it is today, but there were some things that, um, that we had in common with today. One thing was that the world was in a, in a very rapid state of change. The other thing is that we had a very major unpopular war, the Vietnam War, which in many ways is reflective of, um, of the war that, that we have in Iraq today. And one of the results of, um, of things like this, wars and so forth, is that we have a casualty in the truth. The truth seems to be, become lost, and it, it becomes difficult to, to put our hands on, on what exactly is the truth. So, at the ripe age of, uh, of about 18 years old, I think I barely, in fact, I hadn't even turned 18 years old. I was still 17 years old. I left the States, and I went about as far as you could possibly go, which is India. But in the meantime, I stopped off in Paris for the revolution of May 68, uh, at which time... Uh, Basically, the, the whole country of France was, was, uh, was shut down and, uh, and some, some ma major changes seemed to be in the works. Unfortunately, they haven't really matured over the years, but uh, we certainly had high hopes there. But the story is really this, that I arrived in India and very quickly, I seemed to move to an obscure place in Rajasthan, uh, about 60, 70 kilometers from Jaipur, where I met a particular Baba, a Naga Baba. Perhaps I should tell you, I should pause here for just a minute, and tell you what exactly is a Baba. My name is Baba Ramburi. I'm sure all of you have heard the word Baba a number of times. Baba, the word Baba, the word Yogi, the word Sadhu, 
all relate to this basic idea of connection. Yoga means connection. A Baba is basically someone who recognizes all the various personalities of nature that we call the Mother Goddess. Personalities that might be beautiful, that might be benign, that might be horrific, like a tsunami is also a manifestation of, uh, is a personality of nature, of the Mother Goddess. Uh, a, a tree full of fruit is also a personality of the Mother Goddess. A beautiful sunset, a waterfall. So there are a number of different personalities. Some are benign and some can be horrific. Well, a Baba offers his respect to each one of these personalities of nature, of the Mother Goddess. And in so doing, he makes himself or herself almost like a, a tube, like a pipe, to transmit the prosperity of nature to people that come for his or her blessings. So the duty and the reason for a Baba or a yogi is not to put his head, his, his leg behind his, his neck and contort his body in so many ways, but to give people blessings, to make people's lives better. In India, normally it's the poor, simple people that come to a Baba for blessings. It's people who don't really have uh, many choices in life. Uh, they don't have the choice of getting another job or getting a better job or getting a job at all. And sometimes they face situations where they just can see no way out. So they come to a Baba for his blessings. And the Baba connects them to the earth and transmits prosperity. The prosperity can be in terms of of wealth, in terms of money, subsistence, or in terms of health as well. So the primary duty of a Baba is to give blessings and to make people's lives better. So here I was, uh, I was uh, now 18 years old, I had just arrived in India, and uh, I wanted to find uh, extraordinary people. I wanted to find people that um, had powers and abilities that were beyond what was happening in my, uh, in my home. And somehow, I ended up in this place, 70 kilometers from Jaipur, uh, in the hills, in a small ashram, and I met this Baba named Haripuri Baba. But on the day that I arrived to, to meet Haripuri Baba, there was a festival going on. There was something I didn't know. And that was that 10 years before I arrived in that place, Haripuri Baba had gone to visit the most famous astrologer in North India a man by the name of the Bhrugu Shastri. This man had a text, a palm leaf manuscript that was written thousands of years before that contained in it the horoscopes of people that would come to consult his family for thousands of years in the future. Everybody's horoscope that would come to that family was already written down thousands of years before they would come. So how would he consult this text? When people would cross the threshold of his, of his house, of his door, he would look at his watch and he'd write down the time that they would walk in. 
and he would use this time as a basis for going in the back of the house and looking through these thousands and thousands of pages of palm leaf manuscript to find the exact entry for somebody who would enter the dwelling of the astrologer at that particular moment. So Hari Puri Baba crossed the threshold of this astrologer. The astrologer looked at his watch, he wrote down the time, and they looked up in this ancient manuscript what his horoscope would be. They read the horoscope, and one of the items that sort of popped out, that, that, uh, that stuck out to, um, to Hari Puri Baba, was that he would have a foreigner as a disciple, which is very, very rare in India. In fact, in the ancient order that Hari Puri was a member of, there had never been a foreign disciple. So I obviously didn't know all this when I <coughs> entered Hari Puri's ashram and uh, went to meet Hari Puri Baba. And uh, I asked Hari Puri Baba at that time um, what was the reason for the festival. Well, when Hari Puri ten years before that was with the astrologer, not only did they discover that a foreigner would uh, be the disciple of Hari Puri Baba, but they did further calculations and they figured out exactly the day that that foreigner would arrive. And uh, as if on cue, I arrived on that very day. So Hari Puri Baba told me that, in fact, the festival was my welcoming, that uh, everybody was uh, waiting for me. And um, he asked me at that point if I would uh, if I would like to become his disciple. Well, I mean, the whole thing was a little bit shocking for me. And um, I thought to myself and said to him, well, you know, maybe I should check out a few other gurus before uh, I make such a decision. He said to me, well, it's, uh, it's now or never. So. Being a person who's fairly spontaneous, I, um, I said, okay, now. And at that, uh, at that point in time, that day, uh, he made me his disciple, and I became the first foreigner, and in fact, to this day, the only foreigner that's ever been a, um, an initiate of the ancient order of Nagababas. The Nagababas are naked yogis uh, that cover their bodies in ashes, grow long dreadlocks down to the ground, and, uh, and we're, we're known for our excessive chillum smoking and, uh, and somewhat aggressive behavior. So that was about 37 years ago. As the, um, as the years have gone by, strange thing happened. I always had felt like an outsider in my own society, and I certainly felt like an outsider in the society of ancient yogis. After all, I was a foreigner. I was a white man, and uh, these, were, these were all Indians. Uh, I didn't come from an Indian family. My natural kinds of ideas and thoughts and feelings were, were more according to uh, my own culture. But at one point, my guru asked me, he said to me in the same way that, that perhaps your parents have asked some of you, well, you're now uh, such and such an age, you're now 28 years old or 35 years old or whatever, your parents might ask, where are the grandchildren already? Right? We want the family to continue. So in the same way, my guru asked me, okay, where are the disciples already? 
And I said to him, well, I'm not really sort of into disciples. Uh, I sort of like my uh, freedom. I don't feel really uh, qualified, in a sense, to, uh, to have disciples. Well, this didn't really go down all that well with my guru, and um, he gave me some disciples. And after a few more years went by, my gurus died. So there were no more gurus. And when the, when the disciples would come, and I would sort of turn behind me to... Uh, to see my gurus, there wasn't anybody there. So sort of as a, in a process of default, uh, mainly because they weren't there anymore, I acquired these, uh, these disciples in India. And at this point in time, I've actually become the, the head of my family in India. So this is, um, this is uh, approximately the, the, the subject matter of, the, of, of my book. But you see, here I am now in the West. I still live in India, of course, but um, I visit the West. And often, I'm asked the question, Okay, you've had this experience in India. You've, um, you've practiced a discipline uh, in India. You've learned an oral tradition in India. You've learned a shamanistic tradition in, in India. What does this have to do with the West? I find that Actually, the significance of my experience in India is not that I should tell people that they should go to India or that they should think like, uh, like an Indian or, or even uh, study Indian philosophy or anything like that. Uh, I don't think that, that, that people have to go to India or be a Baba or get into, into the Indian trip at all. But having gone through that myself, I feel that um, India can become like a mirror. And it's a mirror that I can hold up to other people in other places so that even though this gathering tonight is called the, the Spirit of India and in fact uh, this week in Frankfurt the Frankfurt Book Fair the special guest is India and India is all over the place I'm actually here to celebrate Frankfurt and celebrate Germany and in the way that I have learned to read the world in Indian tradition, I come here and I see something a little bit different than you might expect. I come here and I look at Frankfurt and I see a very, very ancient and sacred city. There are signs, and you might take this to be uh, ironic or funny, but there are signs here. The world shows signs that we can know things by. The first sign I see in Frankfurt is I see banks all over the place. Mm -hmm. I see German banks and Swiss banks and Hong Kong banks and American banks and British banks. There's banks all over the place, as if growing right out of the ground. And the banks just seem to, to, to get bigger and bigger. 
to me, whether the banks are good or bad, or you have access to any of the wealth that's, uh, that's, that's in the banks, <clears throat> still, the banks are a sign to me of prosperity. That there is something of this place and something of the earth that has caused those banks to be present. And that something is, again, what I would call the mother goddess. That there is a very, very ancient presence of the mother goddess in Frankfurt. And her sign is prosperity. How do you know the mother goddess? How do you know nature? You know the mother goddess and nature by prosperity. Normally, by trees laden with fruit, fields, uh, full of grain, uh, in India, fluoro green rice paddies. And in Frankfurt, you can know her by the banks that have sprung up. <laughs> now the next thing that I'm curious about, because I'm very much involved in language and the sound of things, and I thought about the word Frankfurt what it really means. A German friend explained to me that the meaning of Furt, which uh, she explained to me that, that Furt is, is uh, a place by a river where you cross over. And in this sense, the word Furt in, 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 in German, or perhaps even Old German, is the same as the word Tirtha in Sanskrit. Tirtha is a holy place, but more accurately, Tirtha means a crossing over place, a place where two worlds meet, where worlds meet magic happens, and where two worlds meet, there is a crossing over. The word in Latin is trans. Trans means to cross over, like the root in Sanskrit, tra. And both of this relate to the furt. Now, I say that, that there's an ancient mother goddess that has been worshipped for perhaps thousands and thousands of years where we're sitting tonight there also happens to be a river, the Mine. And it's the river Mine which actually is responsible for this prosperity. That it's where, where you have rivers, where you have fresh water, you have a creative goddess. You have another form of the goddess which gives the possibility for civilization and culture. So this river goddess, the mine, comes by this, this area that's inhabited by the earth mother, the earth goddess, and these banks start <laughs> rising out of, the, out of the earth. So the water of the mine is the holy water of Frankfurt. <laughs> and this is the water. If we were to do uh, rituals, if we were to do shamanic rituals here in Frankfurt, the holy water that we would use, it would be the, the, the holy water of the mine. But what's happened is this, is that there were earth spirits in India we call them yakshas. In different countries in Europe, they go by different names. But the earth spirits traditionally have protected the wealth. They've protected the sanctity of the earth. And in fact, they've even hid the wealth in the earth. But in the past 500, 600 years or so, the greed of man 
has overwhelmed the earth spirits and we've made uh, cement and concrete and roads and so forth over the, the, the earth where the earth spirits have lived. We've put buildings on top of the uh, cement. We've uh, cut down the forests where the various earth spirits lived. And worse than all of this combined is we've stopped believing in them. So the earth spirits have receded into the background and the greed of man has come to the foreground and what is visible to us is the greed of man and what has become invisible to us are the spirits of the earth. And this is where we get to the idea of, uh, of the trans party and the Goa trans party and so forth. Because ultimately, by this means or any other means, uh, one of the, the, the young men tonight uh, asked me, well, what, what is my goal for tonight? And I said to him, well, my goal for tonight is that everybody that is here should connect to everybody else. And having connected, having formed a solid mass of our small humanity here, then we should wake up the earth spirits so that we can start to forge alliances with them. This is the way that we are going to overcome the, the weaknesses of man, his greed and his ignorance, which has created the kind of world that we've created here. So, the, so the, the idea of dancing, the idea of music, the idea of celebration is to make a connection first among ourselves, a solid connection among ourselves. And having made that connection, we have to wake up the earth spirits. We have to bring them back onto the surface of the earth, of the world, and we have to make them a viable force in our future. So what is the connection between the, a spirit and man? You see, we are matter. We are dense. We have bodies. And spirit, by its very nature, has no body, no density, no material. Spirits are knowledge. Spirit consists of pure knowledge. But pure knowledge doesn't do anything because it has no materiality. And here we are, we're like empty body-mind shells of matter. So man and spirit make a deal. Man and spirit come together. That man seeks knowledge and spirit seeks materiality. The deal is this, that when man gets the knowledge from spirit, man gives arms and legs to knowledge. Man gives arms and legs materiality to the spirit, to that knowledge. And this is a, a union which creates very positive effects. And this is one of the goals, I think th this is one of the major goals of, uh, of the trans party. When we, uh, when we link up with each other and, uh, and we dance. So, I don't want to spend all my time speaking at you. I would like to speak with you. So, I would like to invite you to ask questions, to make comments, so that we can share some conversation together. And, uh, and after we do that, 
I have brought with me some magical things from India. Mm -hmm. I've brought with me some sacred ashes from a fire that's been burning for 5,000 years mm -hmm. that the Babas use as a means mm -hmm. of giving blessings. Mm -hmm. So I brought ashes for all of you and I'd be very happy to put them on your third eyes. And I brought a few Rudraksha seeds, which are the mark of connection between uh, the matter and spirit, between man and, as they say in, in, in India, Shiva. And I brought a few yantras, which are magical seats for inviting the mother goddess to come down into your presence. And uh, the mother goddess, one of the, the ways that, um, that we develop a relationship with the mother goddess is by asking her for things as if she was our physical mother. And we ask for trivial things at first to create an intimacy with, uh, with the mother goddess, with nature. And then uh, after we have an intimacy, then we can ask for, for bigger and bigger things. So I have these things that uh, I've brought to give you. And uh, in the meantime, why don't we have some discussion about some of the things that I've talked about tonight. Because I'll, I will warn you that I'm very contrarian, <laughs> and uh, I'm very radical in my views, and I am certainly not what they call New Age. I may be from California, but I'm not of California. <laughs> so um, I, I see myself uh, in terms of, uh, in spiritual terms, as a subversive. And... Um, I'm very happy to, to discuss that with, with anybody that would like to know about uh, being a spiritual subversive. Anybody have any comments or questions? Why do you live in California? I'm sorry? Why do you live in California? Why do I live in California? Why I left America? Yeah. Well, um, let, let me put it in, in a couple ways. Uh, I left America in 1968 because it was just too small. <laughs> it was way too small. And the reason that I sort of continue to leave it in my mind is because it remains even smaller. Um, personally, I see that there is so much happening in places like Germany today. I think that there's um, a, a freshness in, uh, in Northern and Eastern Europe that I find very, very impressive, uh, at least compared to um, other parts of the world. Um, I've just I've just now been in America for about three weeks, and I was in the UK for a couple weeks. And I can tell you that, um, that Anglo-American culture is uh, lagging way behind. And you may be critical about what's happening here, but I can tell you that in a comparative sense, if we're going to compare it to what's happening in, uh, in, in the States and in the UK, there is a lot more happening, there's a lot more thinking going on, a lot more intelligence, and a lot more culture. Yeah. And I'm thrilled to be here, I really am. And I, I'll say one other thing, that, um, that um, I've been, I, I left India in July, and one of the first places that I visited was Latvia. I was invited to Riga, because uh, my book was translated into Russian, and 
and uh, I got an invitation uh, while I was still sitting in, in India to, to visit Latvia. And to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't even know where Latvia was. I just knew it was somewhere in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. And when I went there, I was just, I was completely blown away by the, by the freshness of people. I mean, they just uh, basically uh, uh, became free from, from the Soviet Union, what was it, 12 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever it was. And, uh, and I found an incredible freshness of spirit. And also, I recognized the people that had suffered. And um, I believe that, that suffering uh, brings about wisdom. <coughs> I think it's very difficult to come by wisdom if one hasn't suffered. Now, I think it's true individually, but it's, it's also true culturally. And one thing I can tell you about America is America hasn't suffered yet. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why the ignorance level is, is so high there. But not in this room today. But not in this room? Yeah, I think so. It's I really agree with difficult you. to get uh, in a productive discuss with you because you say everything is right and all what we say can is uh, yes. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's why I'm here. Yeah. And I can feel that. And, and that's really why I say like I'm here to celebrate <laughs> Frankfurt. I'm here to celebrate Germany. I'm here to celebrate some new friends. Yeah. And I think we are all new friends together in this room. <laughs> and celebrate a little absent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and how far are you radical? How far? Yeah, you said you're radical, so what do you mean by that? What I mean by that, well, let's, let's, let's look at the word subversive. Do you know the word subversive? Do you, do you, yes. do you use that at all? Me, yes. Huh? <laughs> you do. I uh, use uh, subversive literature in Germany, so yes. Okay. I know subversive. Okay. Well, it's interesting. If we look at, at the word, what it means, what does sub mean? Sub means beneath. Versive, the words. Yep. So what I like to do is I like to look at the language and look at the words and actually just go below the words. And, um, and we find some, some very interesting things because actually I think that the, the greatest act of subversion, the greatest radical act, is to tell the truth. <laughs> this is incredibly radical because it's something that we are trained from the, from the moment that we're born not to do. And it's the very basis of our society because our society is a society of consumption. Right? We, we learn to consume. Uh, now, if, if our consumption and consumerism was limited to the economy, me, I'm not an economist. I don't know which economic systems are good, which ones work, which ones don't work. But the truth of the matter is, is that consumption and consumerism doesn't remain within the economy. It spills into our lives. And what's even worse, it spills into our relationships with each other. So what happens is that as with a product, as with Coca-Cola, uh, we are advertised to and advertise. And here we go, we've lost the truth from the very beginning. Because once the advertising begins, the first casualty of advertising is the truth. This is where we stop telling the truth. Okay, so in our relationships with each other, we advertise to, we advertise and we're advertised to. That's the first step. The second step 
is that we buy into. We accept the advertising, right? The advertising is, is tempting, right? Coca-Cola says, have the real thing, drink the real thing, and we want the real thing, so we buy into it. We obtain the bottle of Coca-Cola. Well, once you got the bottle of Coca-Cola, what good is it if you don't drink it? Yeah. All right? So then we drink it, we consume it. And what happens is that it's finished. We finish it up. So the next thing we have to do is get another one. And this is basically what happens to our relationships, whether it's male-female relationships or any other relationships that, um, that we have in our lives. So actually, the, the, real, the real dangers that we face from, from the way that our culture works is not dangers out there somewhere, but dangers that are very, very close to home, that, that right in our immediate lives. This is, this is the danger. So the subversive, <coughs> the subversive act is to stop consuming, stop consumption, and start telling the truth. I, I, I think uh, shop that they think is going to make them happy. Prosperous in the sense that you give them health that you give them wealth and health. Even though you may not be a rich man yourself, you can touch people. And first, touch the people that are closest to you. Then take the next concentric circle. Your best friend, your close friends, your, um, you know, the people that, uh, that you seem to, to connect with. And touch each one of them. Remember, this is all giving, this is not taking. This is all giving. You touch them, and you make them prosperous, you make them healthy and wealthy. And then you draw your next concentric circle, which might be uh, your, uh, your tribe, your group, you know, the general people that you might uh, hang out with or you might meet at a, you know, at a party or something like that. And touch each one of them. And then your community and then your city, and then your state, and then your country, and then finally the whole fucking world. And you touch everybody, and you make everybody prosperous and healthy. Now, if you can do that, that would be the, the, the greatest act of revolution, and you transform the world. Short of that, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> But we're not touching enough people. And we're not touching the people that are closest to us. And I'm not saying to go out and touch people that you don't know. And I'm not talking about having an idea about touching people. I'm telling you something extremely practical. Yeah. Look at the people that are closest to you, that are right there, that are right next to you, and touch them and connect with them. <laughs> India is a land based on a Hinduistic tradition. Speak just a little louder. India is a land based on a, on Hinduism, Hinduistic tradition, and I think you are also in this tradition. Um, for me, this Hinduism religion and all these thoughts here around are not so much about freedom. They, for me, they stand also for um, very hard discrimination of women, for repressive structures, for a society with, which is structured in different classes which you are born in. Um, for me, that's not very much spiritual. Not very much uh, freedom. How do you see that? I think you're right. I think you're, <laughs> I think you're completely right about that. <laughs> Me, I'm, I'm not into religion at all. I think, in fact, I don't really believe in religion. I think religion is actually a lie in the first place because I think religion is politics. 
right? What we're doing is we're taking politics and we're, we're, we're giving it a different package, a package that's more acceptable to people, you know, that, that makes people feel pious and makes people feel good and that they're going to heaven and, uh, and all this other stuff. But really what it is, it's just politics that's repackaged and you call it a religion. Now it's curious that in, in India uh, we have this word Hinduism. But this word Hinduism and this whole idea of Hinduism is a colonial, a colonial term and a colonial idea. Because really what we had in India before the, uh, the British came in and, and colonized India is you had a million different things going on in every which place you had a million different sort of ideas and rituals and, and relationships and uh, you had every little place that you would go to had a whole different trip going on. And in fact, this idea of, of gods like Shiva and Ganesh and, and so forth, this is a very, very modern thing that's happened because really the truth of the matter is that each small place had its own deity. It had its own earth spirits in the same way that I spoke about earth spirits before. And, uh, and people worship earth spirits and deal with their own locality in their different ways. And you know, wherever you go in the world, I hate to say it, but people are fucked up. There is no place in the world where people seem to have their act together. And what happens is that, uh, look, at, look at the contrast of Frankfurt. Uh, if, if I am correct in saying, and I believe I am correct in saying this, that Frankfurt is a very ancient, sacred place, and it's an ancient, sacred place because of the presence of this mother goddess which creates prosperity, you can say to me, what happened? Right? You got this ancient sacred place with this ancient sacred deity and all this ancient sacredness and, 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 and look what you got. You got all these people living in this incredible illusion uh, with all this greed and, and creating all these problems and pollution and conflicts and all this other stuff. Well, what we have here in Frankfurt and there in India and almost every, every other place I know of in the world, you have men and women that live in illusion. You have men and women who, uh, who practice, who are greedy, who are angry, who are aggressive, who are violent. And when there is something like the mother goddess creating prosperity, the mother goddess is not moralistic. She doesn't choose. It's not like a, a Christian concept of a god that has the select, you know, the chosen and the unchosen, all of that. The mother goddess doesn't care. Does an apple tree care who eats its apples? No. It just makes apples, and whoever comes along, whether they're good people or bad people, or hungry people or not hungry people, anybody can eat the apples. So what happens is that when you have prosperity, and when you have, uh, 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 for example, the presence of, of a sacred goddess that creates the prosperity, the other side of the balance is that People become very greedy, and they want to covet, they want to possess that, uh, that prosperity. So these, these are the real problems uh, in, in, in the world. So when you have people that want to possess the prosperity and, and keep other people away from the prosperity, this is the birth of politics. And... Uh, and yet politics looks so dirty and so nasty. So that the most clever of politicians, they create a packaging for politics so it doesn't look so bad. And they call that packaging religion.
whether it's Christianity, so-called Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, it's all the packaging of politics in, uh, in something that looks nice and something that's acceptable. So I think that, that your perception is, is completely correct, uh, but you have to apply that same perception to, to all places. Did you expect me to say that? <laughs> no, I didn't expect anything. Anything, I just wanted to know that was the reason because I asked. Me, I like local. I don't like universal. I don't believe in universal things. I like local things. I like local traditions. I like local situations. Uh, and I like local people. You mean pure people? Sorry? You mean pure people? Pure people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real people. Yeah. You know, real people might not be pure. Uh, real people still might be fucked up, might have their problems, might do weird things and so forth, but at least they're real. They exist. You can touch them. I mean not poor, pure. Huh? I mean not poor, I mean pure. Yes, yes. Different. Yeah, sometimes actually though, the, the two are the same. Sometimes yeah. it's the poor people that yeah. are the pure people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that in my experience, it's the poor people that are the generous people. <laughs> Everywhere I've gone in the world, you know, especially, well, not especially India, everywhere. Anywhere where you go, where you're with poor people, they're the most generous. Poor people are willing to give you uh, everything. everything. They're willing, if there's only so much food for the family, poor people are willing you to give you it. everything. They're willing to give you the only blankets on yeah, a cold yeah, night. Yeah, I know. Very often wealthy people aren't willing to give you a crumb for That's the it. table. That's so there's, there's a big difference. And, and this perhaps is a universal quality. Even though I'm not into universal things, Perhaps this is one of the few universal qualities. But you still stop understand what you mean. Hmm? So would anybody like uh, me to give them blessings in the form of uh, sacred ashes? If you would, come up. Yes. And I also have some other things. If, if you want, please just ask me. Yeah, from the Ganga? Huh? These ashes come from the Ganga? The ashes, these are the ashes from, from, the from, from, the, from wood. <coughs> from wood burning in fire. And what we, what we do is we keep certain sacred fires that never go out. So the fire that, that these ashes come from is a fire that's been burning for 5,000 years. With never going out. <coughs> yes, yes, yes. That when, when we're younger, when I was younger, I would, I, would, I would do this, I'd put the ashes all over my body. They do? They still do? Yes, of course. Still, still I, me, me, I don't do anymore because um, I'm a little bit older and I'll, and I'll tell you but something. The young, the, young the young ones definitely do. <coughs> See, the other thing that ashes may dry out your skin a little bit. And <laughs> if, you, if you want to keep sort of uh, softer, younger skin, then ashes aren't really the way to go. Right? But when you're young, you don't care about these things. <laughs> I see it many times in Nepal. Uh huh. Just come from India, they go to Nepal. Uh huh. Just 20 years ago, I never see it again. I was lucky to see it. And what is what is the what is the difference between a Baba and a Sadhu? You know that? There's basically no difference. No? Why they call the Baba and why they call the Sadhu? Well. I think that sadhu is a very much more formal word. Um, it's almost like saying the, the, the difference between papa and father. Right? That the word baba seems to be more intimate. 
and more familiar. And sadhu is more wild. Sadhu basically means a good person. Mm. Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 Baba sort of means like what it sounds like. It, it's a very comfortable feeling in Baba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Do you think it's possible to have spiritual uh, progress without a teacher? Yes. Yes? Um, I, I definitely think it's, uh, it's definitely possible to make spiritual progress without a teacher. See, a, a teacher a teacher is important for, for one basic thing. Um, if there is a tradition, and when, when I speak about tradition, I mean an oral tradition, because a, 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 a non-oral tradition you can get from books, and I don't think it's worth much. Uh, if, if one is to practice an oral tradition, that one must plug into that oral tradition and connect into the teachings. And for that reason, one would need a, uh, a teacher. But a teacher, not just any teacher, not some teacher that comes up with some ideas, but a teacher who also had a teacher from that tradition, who had a teacher before him, who had a teacher before him. So to practice, esoteric arts, to practice shamanism, to practice these things, then yes, I think it's extremely important. But to make spiritual progress, no. I think for making spiritual progress, you have to open your heart up, you have to stop taking, start giving, and touch people. And that is making tremendous spiritual progress. I'm also not into the, the kind of spiritual progress which is self-indulgent, which um, where you focus on me. Any focus on me is, it, to me, is not a, a, a true spiritual practice. So, I mean, in, in the West now, of course, there's all these, you know, you go for a, a, a seminar, a, a weekend, or, you know, a week <coughs> or something, and you pay 3,500 euros, and, uh, you know, after... Uh, you know, after a weekend or something, they give you a certificate that now you're uh, yeah, right. balanced or you like something. It. You like it. Yeah. I mean, I could, I, 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 I'll tell you this story I, that to me is very funny. I, I, I hope you see it in the same way. Uh, about a year ago, this um, this friend of mine started talking about this uh, thing that happens in India, this, this, this organization, this uh, situation in India, where you go for three weeks and you pay $4,000 and you get enlightened, right? So uh, actually she called me up in India on the telephone and she says, well listen, I'm, I'm thinking of, of going to this, this program, right, for three weeks. <coughs> All it is is three weeks, $4,000, and you get enlightened. And I said, are you, are you kidding? You know, you, you really believe this? And she says, yeah, well, why not? You know, people are saying they're getting enlightened, man, three weeks. So, uh, so she was trying to tell her husband to take her to India to, uh, to do this. And, of course, her husband uh, uh, sort of ignored that. And they had these other friends, this couple, um, where the, uh, this Tony was a motivational speaker. And he would go all over the country and all over the world to tell people how to live happier lives and make more money and have better sex and, you know, all these sort of things, right? And he would, he would give these uh, lectures. Now, his problem was that uh, his wife had this, this sort of uh, uh, problem since childhood in that she was always vomiting, right? She had a vomiting problem, and especially whenever she would go in a car or a plane or a boat or anything, she would vomit. 
and everybody knew this about uh, about his wife, you know, and always I guess kept a little bit of distance, you know, in case some accident should happen. So um, so this Tony and his wife they go to India. They pay the four thousand dollars for this three week uh, three week enlightenment course, and what happens? At the end of three weeks, I don't know if they're enlightened, but his wife stopped vomiting, right? Wow. The effect was she stopped vomiting, right? So, uh, so, uh, so he told uh, uh, my friend Peter that uh, about this, and Peter was impressed with this, not so much because of the enlightenment, but because of uh, the fact that. She stopped vomiting. So, uh, so, so this was this was so impressive that um, immediately this Tara wanted to uh, to go to India to take this course. But she didn't have three weeks. She only had two weeks. So she asked, "Well, can I get it in two weeks?" Right. What if I pay five thousand dollars, right? And uh, and this is this is really what's uh, what's become of um, of this this sort of thing. It, 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 it's gone the way of, uh, of consumption. These are these are things that uh, that you buy instead of do. <laughs> But it's the way of the world today. What do you think about Dalai Lama? What about the Dalai Lama? I just saw the Dalai Lama. When? I, I saw him in Los Angeles about two weeks ago. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. a wonderful, wonderful man. But I tell you where I saw him. I saw him in a place that's called uh, Universal uh, Universal City Amphitheater. And it's one of these sort of theme parks, like Disneyland, where there's a, where there's a big mall, and all sorts of uh, things going on in the mall, and things you can buy, and flash, and, and things things to eat. So anyway, you you walk down this mall, you know, where on both sides all this action happening, and finally you get to the amphitheater, and when you get to the amphitheater, the first thing you have to do is you have to, you have to give away, you have to throw away your mineral water. Suppose you have mineral water, you have to throw away your mineral water because maybe you carry explosives in your mineral water, right? So everybody has to uh, give their mineral water. Then you go into the, uh, into the amphitheater, and they have um, all these pl all these places where you buy food: hot dogs and hamburgers and popcorn and peanuts and uh, cappuccinos and all these things. So that when you go into to see the Dalai Lama, you you bring in a pile of food like this because you don't want to be without food. When you when you see the Dalai Lama, you want to have enough food to last the forty five minutes or the one hour when he might be speaking. So uh, so everybody would come in and they would be eating their popcorn, watching uh, the Dalai Lama and the the Dalai Lama, who I have tremendous respect for. Don't don't misunderstand me. I have tremendous respect for. Uh, the Dalai Lama would came in and tell a few jokes to warm up the audience and then uh, do, his, uh, do his little talk. So I mean the, the result of this is that, uh, excuse me, but this is showbiz, this is, this is Hollywood, this is the entertainment uh, this is, industry. Yeah, but this is like the Americans do it, I saw Dalai Lama last year, yeah. In a big park, not like this. Uh, well, the Dalai, Lama, the Dalai Lama will, will perform according to the expectations of his audience. Yeah. And if his, if and his he audience... Speaks, he speaks in his own language, yeah. I like that. He speaks in Tibetan, 
People smoking? It's not so much smoking here. I think, I think that whenever you make a, a, a festival, it's always good to make it on a water place. That, that the best place to make a, a festival is by a river, by a lake, by any source of water. I think this is always best, and this is always where the, the most spirits sort of hang out. Uh, either, either in, and if you can't make it on water, then make it in the forest. Make it deep in the forest. So you, you have this sort of connection with, with the spirits. Yeah. Water is one of the elements of life. Mm. And uh, if I don't know how to make such a, um, such thing, uh, can I can I make my own um, kind of celebrity uh, or if I want to 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 connect to this uh, spirit? What do I have to do? The first thing is um, you have to see your where you live as, as a sacred place. And you have to look around and understand what makes it sacred. So I'm, I've been using the example of Frankfurt. Right? The, uh, you look for the signs. You look for signs that, that indicate things. And... Um, uh, for example, in Frankfurt, what I would do is I would um, take the water from the mine and I would keep that water in, uh, in your house and I would offer that water to spirits. And this is a very basic, basic act of ritual that is very, very important in India, and I think it's probably in many other places as well, is when, for example, when a guest comes in your house, one of the things that you do is you offer him a glass, him or her a glass of water, all right? This is a basic sort of, uh, okay, in modern society, maybe you offer him or her a glass of beer, you know, or a glass of wine or some absinthe, all right? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you make an offering of a drink, and, um, and so what I would do is, is I, would, um, I would make an offering of, um, of the water from the mine to, uh, to the earth spirits, and, and start playing with that, and I think you'll see some sort of response. Also, if you want me to give you a, a yantra, which is a sacred enclosure. It's, it's like a, a throne for the mother goddess. Uh, I'll give you a yantra, and you can put that in your house on a piece of red cloth, because the mother goddess likes red for some reason. And, um, and what you can do is offer a few drops of the water from the mine, and you can offer a flower and maybe a piece of fruit, and maybe light a stick of incense or something, and you can start in that way to develop a sense of intimacy with the mother goddess and with nature. So anything which is a giving thing is a good thing for making ritual? Yes, it's yes. That, uh, I can choose what I offer? Absolutely, 
absolutely. But, but it's very important. You see, if you can offer the different elements, water, fire, earth, air, and ether, right? Ether is sound, okay? Huh? Last time, I don't know the word. Ether, it's space. So you could think of um, space being sound, uh, wind being touch, fire being sight, earth being smell, and water being taste. This is the way that the five elements that make up the earth are connected to our sense of perception. So if you can offer, for example, uh, the water, uh, you might light a candle, which is fire. Right? You might burn some incense, which is like earth, the smell. Okay? You can offer a fruit, which is taste, you see? And if it make the offerings of the ways that you perceive the world to a spirit, um, I think you'll, you'll start to feel something from that. And you'll, you'll understand intuitively what to, what to do next. But I would start with water. You know, you think of the same way a guest comes in your house, you offer him or her a glass of wine or beer, or offer the earth spirit from the Frankfurt area with the holy water of the mind. But I'm a person who's traveling around a lot, uh -huh. by going to festivals, giving massage, and uh -huh. and, and But do you live here? No, I come from uh, Where do you live? Huh? It's, uh, okay. Of is there is there a river there? Yes. Okay. It doesn't matter. I tell you. You know when I was in when I was in Riga, as they have, um, we we made a big ritual there. Um, uh, a, rit a ritual to counter the effect of the planet Saturn, right? Because Saturn, the Christians would tell you that Saturn is Satan, that it's evil. But Saturn is not evil, it's repressive. It stops things from happening. So sometimes you make a ritual to get rid of that vibe. So we were making a ritual to, to, to get rid of the vibe of repression. And um, so what we did is, is, um, is I sent some of the people out with empty bottles of mineral water to, to fill up the, the water from the Dalgava, which is the river in, in Riga. And um, as far as I know, it may be the most polluted river in Europe. I wouldn't doubt it for a second. But uh, after the ritual... Huh? Drink the water? Absolutely, one drop. I gave one drop to, to every person, and a funny thing happened is that over the next week that I was there, so many people came up to me and said, you know, uh, before we were Christians and we didn't really understand it, and now we've been in this yoga society for five years and we never really understood it. But when we tasted a drop of our holy water, not because it's in the church, or not because somebody says it, it's so, but because it comes from the river of, which creates the city where your blood is attached to. That made sense to people. Yeah. That's the ancient truth. So I think that um, the water, and especially the water from a river, and especially the water from a large river which has created, given birth to a culture, um, this, this is holy water and this, this is good to use. Um, if I say that I need to teach 
Well, the best thing is not to look for one. Because, you see, because look, you know, you don't want to, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to, Approach a teacher in the same way that that you approach a um, you know muesli, uh, and and sort of go to the market and, and and look at the box of muesli and make sure that all the ingredients are biodynamic and uh, sugar free and all this other stuff. <laughs> and if you if you're going to approach it with the, with a consumer attitude, with the attitude of consumption. I tried, but I did not find the right time. <laughs> 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 because I, I thought, no, this, it cannot be this. It's expensive. The uh, one, this is good, the other one says this is good. Everybody says just his own thing is the best. It cannot be right. That's what I found out. So I'm trying to find my own way. Hmm. Not so easy. I think that, that most people don't need teachers. <laughs> most people. <laughs> and if you want to follow something specific, I mean, if you want to uh, learn how to do a particular thing, whether it's artistic or music or business, or, okay. If you're gonna if you're gonna learn a specific thing, then you may you know it may be good to have a, a teacher to teach you that specific thing. But you know, the ancient uh, truth here is lost. That's the problem. The ancient. And, and that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm saying, and this is the problem. This is, this is a huge problem. This is why I am saying that you have to awaken and recognize the earth spirits and you have to make a connection with the earth spirits and you have to relate to the earth spirits because the earth spirits are going to give you knowledge and you have to give knowledge arms and legs. But I think it starts from really connecting with each other and using that power of connection and giving to awaken these spirits. You have to connect with each other and stop consuming each other. Giving to each other, not taking from each other. And, and again, starting in small circles around you and going slowly, slowly outwards in concentric circles. It's not just doing this with anyone. I don't believe in that. Um, to uh, for for a spiritual process for what to, for a spiritual pro, um, process yeah uh, you have to open your your heart yes and give but what if uh, your experiences and in your life make your heart close and because of your experiences you cannot open your heart any anymore like, like well I would say child. first what? of all I would say if the experience in your life have to make your heart closed because it's that kind of world it's a consumer world everybody's eating everybody else yeah. right so i mean you the, the, you know it, it, it's like i was in um i was in uh uh in, in the states in this one place giving a talk and i and i was talking about um uh, aggression and violence and uh the the that we seem to, to uh, try and solve all our problems with, with aggression and violence, and that aggression and violence doesn't really work in a strategic way. I'm not talking morals, I'm not saying good or bad, I'm just saying <coughs> that aggression and violence doesn't really, it, it's hard to make it work. And, and somebody raised his hands and said, okay, there you are, you're the pilot of a plane, and somebody uh, uh, kicks down the door and, and, and wants to uh, hijack the plane, what do you do? I said, well, you chop his head off. What's the big deal? What's there to think, right? That, um, that, that uh, somebody, somebody wants to uh, attack your husband or wife or your child or this or that. Well, you, you, you just deal with the situation. You, 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 you do what you have to do. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that you take that, that same sort of thing to every situation. Because if you take that same thing to every situation, 
it's going to fail. So your normal reaction is to, is to close your heart. And this is why I'm saying that when you start touching people, you have to start with the people that are the closest to you. You have to start with close people. The people that you have to, the first person that, that you start with is the person that is the absolute closest person in your entire life. And you have to touch that person and you have to make that person healthy and wealthy. You can't compel love. When you, when you say, when you see uh, a beautiful sunset and you say, I love this sunset, it's a beautiful sunset, I love, can you compel that sunset to love you back? It's not an issue of, of, of compelling a sunset to, to, to love you back. And this is the same way that when you touch somebody and you touch somebody close to you, you're just giving. There is no, there is no question of receiving back also. It's not that I'm giving so that I get given back to and then nobody gives anything back to me and I'm ripped off. That's not the issue. You're not giving so that you get something back. And that's why you start with the people that are closest to you. And if you start with people that are out there, then of course you can get ripped off. Right? You have to build it up. No? of time now at the moment. So okay. We have a time problem like always. Okay. Just the last question. Okay, last maybe, question. Maybe last question and you have also the chance to talk individually to him. No last problem. Last question for But me, please. For, yes. <laughs> so, uh, how do you think about uh, Goa music and trance music uh, in the, as a sense of a global community and like a politically uh, common uh, opinions of well personally I like I said before I'm into local I'm into local yeah. and uh, and I think that the really important thing is um, is that you connect locally and then when you really have a local connection local connection spreads and how do you think about the uh, global Goa communement so, so, uh, like a movement uh, of the I don't believe people in all over the world I don't believe in movement You don't believe it. I don't believe in any movements. It's, uh, I don't believe I in ideas. It's just a way for people in all over the world to get together and uh, I think find and, uh, I believe in spontaneity. Level, you know? I believe that can happen uh, in terms of spontaneity. Because to be perfectly honest with you, I've been he hearing about movements for almost 50 years now. Yeah. Right? You know, for 40 years, sure for 40 years, since 1966, yeah. I've been hearing about movements and, and, yes. and okay. you well, know, I protests and, and world, demonstrations you know, and, and I, uh, all this I other stuff, and I haven't seen any result. I have the same opinion with the Goa movement in this uh, political sense, I think. Uh, I believe more in the Frankfurt movement than the Goa movement. No, no, I come from Heidelberg. <laughs> <laughs> the Heidelberg movement, I'm not okay? Okay, the Heidelberger movement. <laughs> Heidelberger, but uh, not really from the from the group, So I just uh, a global player, you know. And so I think uh, this is uh, one of the ways to get people together all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, music is one very important thing to get people together. See what what to me what's important is that um, that people come together in local places and connect with the the earth, the local spirits. Yes. And in another place people get together and connect with the local spirits. So that in fact the real movement is is a huge movement to connect with the earth and to, yes. to wake awaken all the spirits all over the world. Yes, we have all and the and to, up to up come together with the them. Goa music is one part of yes, the yes, I agree. Whole, uh, movement so. Yes. Because we are here in the Goa club, and so I think uh, I'm a uh, Goa fraggle, we call it. In It's because the Earth Spirit starts at 180. <laughs> That's it. That's it. But with that said, what I suggest is that we now move this connection thing to another level. Let's start dancing. 
and uh, connecting with each other. And let's see, you know, what kind of an army of earth spirits we can raise by the morning. Yeah. Okay. okay. And and in the meantime, if if a few of you want to come up and speak to me privately, then uh, then please do. I'll I'll be sitting here. But I think it's time to uh, to uh, dance. Okay. We just uh, consider about what to say, and then we're dancing and drink some absinthe. Thank you very much. If you want ashes, I'll give you some ashes also. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Should I take it for myself? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But put no, 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 no. Put put your hand out like this. <coughs> oh, okay. put your hand like this. <laughs> Throw it in your mouth. <laughs> Thank you.